Okay, uh, thank you for having us here at this uh, seminar. So it's a pleasure to indeed present our uh, research. Um, actually, I will start with a more general uh, framework, a more theoretical framework for uh, studying media use during a pandemic or during a lockdown. And then uh, Anouk will continue and will really focus on the research that we uh, did. Uh, so I will start uh, sharing my screen. Um, okay, so hopefully you can see the presentation. Um, so yes, uh, this is the title of our uh, study. Um, and actually I would like to start with uh, perhaps sketching a little bit uh, my uh, academic background. Um, I actually started my uh, academic uh, career about 20 years ago, and then I did a PhD on uh, the use of media by prisoners, and it was called uh, a captive audience. Um, and you can see on the right hand of the slide that that was my theoretical model. So actually I would uh, wanted to explain uh, prisoners media use and I looked at the characteristics they brought with them to the prison environment, like their social demographic uh, background profile, but also their, their criminal lifestyle. And then I also looked at the, at the other hand at the situation within prisons to explain uh, the problems they experienced. And I also looked at how this could explain prisoners' media use. So I then concluded that uh, media were very important in prison, of course, and that television especially was very important. So these prisoners uh, on average uh, watched more than five hours a day. Um, and this was considerably higher than the average uh, television use of the Flemish uh, person. And one main reason was, of course, the lack of alternatives. So uh, many prisoners stayed uh, 22 hours a day uh, uh, on their cell. So um, yeah, television was very important to them. Um, the study also uh, taught me that uh, Prisoners actually watch different types of contents. They are, of course, very interested in watching the news because in this way they can keep up to date with what is happening uh, outside. But on the other hand, they were also really into following entertainment television, like, for instance, crime and action series, but also soaps, for instance. And then the third um, aspect was that um, I really saw that media were very important because they could ease the pain and the stress of being imprisoned. So they could relieve boredom. Uh, they made uh, prisoners feel not so isolated anymore. So it, when they turned on their television screen, for instance, they had the feeling that there was somebody with them. Um, so I really noticed that television is very important and that television can indeed help people cope with uh, stress and especially, of course, in a prison situation. Um, I never thought that my PhD would be relevant again um, as much as uh, it was or appeared to be uh, last year, because then indeed we uh, uh, landed in the pandemic and there was also a lockdown in Belgium. The first lockdown started uh, in March and this really caused a kind of flashback uh, for me at least. So I had a similar feeling as the prisoners in my PhD research because indeed uh, we were also obliged to stay at home and again this was also a very stressful situation not only were people worried about their health, of the health of their, um, their family members, but of course, being in a lockdown situation also created other types of uh, problems, like indeed a lack of freedom, a lack of autonomy, uh, a lack of privacy. Uh, suddenly you had to uh, work and live with your family members like 24 hours a day. Um, so it also created uh, similar problems as in a kind of prison situation. And therefore we thought about, okay, um, so in this situation, can we also have a look at people's media use and can this media use indeed also 
help people cope with the pandemic and more particular also with the lockdown situation. So that was uh, the question that, that we would like to answer. And um, actually, um, I would like to focus now on two theoretical perspectives that really seemed useful to us to, uh, to apply in this uh, context. Of course, um, there is the literature on media use and coping. So you can see here on the slides on the right side that there was recently a scoping review of colleagues who really looked at the literature and uh, they concluded that uh, the relationship between coping and media use through uh, media, yeah, and media use was actually looked at from uh, th three different perspectives. So on the one hand, you had more the literature uh, from uh, the psychological literature focusing on stress and coping, which provides some kind of basis on what is stress and what are coping strategies and how can media use fit into these coping strategies. But on the other hand, there was also a second perspective, and that was uh, a more typical communication uh, perspective. It was mood management uh, theory. This is really a theory from our own fields, which suggests that people's mood can indeed influence the media selections they make. So if people are feeling happy, they will likely be uh, willing to uh, continue or even intensify that feeling. Um, and if you're happy, then you are probably uh, likely to select uh, contents that yeah, increase that feeling like listening to happy music. But on the other hand, mood management theory also suggests that if pe people are feeling stressed or if people are feeling bad, they're going to use media in a way that they can uh, upregulate their emotions so that the negative feelings disappear and that they can again have some more positive feelings. So if you are feeling stressed, you will perhaps uh, look for more relaxing contents or if you're angry, you're going to look for um, uh, contents that make you happy again. And then the third um, angle or theoretical perspective is the one on problematic media use and there too they make the connection between how do people usually cope with stress does that for instance also mean that they uh, are going to consume let's say uh, television or internet contents or games more and does that also mean that if you really rely on that strategy, that this could, for instance, also lead to a kind of addiction, addiction to games, addiction to the internet as a way of yeah, coping with the harsh reality. And of course, this is then seen as a more maladaptive way of using media to cope with uh, stress. So these are the main angles. And I already said that they actually come from very di different perspectives. So the psychological perspective really says what stress is. So it's a, a kind of relationship between the person and his or her environment. And actually the environment is uh, appraised as uh, being very challenging and uh, the person has as a feeling that he or she cannot cope with uh, the situation or cannot manage the si situation. And that then creates uh, the feeling of stress. Uh, and if people are feeling stressed, uh, this is, of course, very negative state um, and they will try to do something about this. And uh, here the uh, concept of coping strategies comes in. So how will people try to cope with the problem or with the negative emotions they are uh, feeling? And here the psychological literature mentions actually the, the existence of different types of coping strategies like approach strategies, uh, uh, really uh, looking at the problem and, and trying to find the solution or avoidance strategies, for instance, trying to yeah, uh, get distracted from the problem, not being confronted with the problem. So you have also this kind of categorization of coping strategies. And media, of course, are sometimes considered uh, coping strategy as such, but actually they can be linked to all of these uh, previous categorizations. So sometimes media 
can, for instance, um, help people in finding a solution for the problem. Uh, for instance, if you are in a pandemic, you could indeed try to follow the news and uh, in this way uh, find ways to, to deal with uh, the situation. But entertainment could also uh, help people to avoid the problem and to get distracted. Um, and of course, the selections we make, they can be uh, kind of reasoned. Uh, so you really are aware that you are selecting a certain uh, media content to deal with a situation or the, the thing or the media use can actually also be quite automatic. Uh, so for instance, you might be not uh, be aware that you're actually selecting a certain type of music to deal with the current situation. So, and then the last as aspect is that, of course, you can also then look at how effective certain coping strategies are. So are they adaptive in the long term or not? So if you uh, used to uh, yeah, fall back to certain coping strategies, um, will you at the end be, um, yeah, better suited to deal with life? Are you happier? Uh, so what are the outcomes actually of these uh, strategies? Um, here, I would already like to show a little bit of the existing research on COVID-19 and media use. Um, and here you can actually see uh, three types of research uh, that have already been done. Um, so the first type of research really looks at news media and their role in the pandemic. And there you can, for instance, see that indeed news can uh, also contribute to stress and to worries. Uh, here you see a study that looked at how oftentimes people were exposed to news and how worried they were about corona. Uh, but of course, news can also help us and can help us also cope with the situation. A second type of research looked more at uh, social support as a kind of coping strategy. So uh, here you can see a study that looked at how people use social media like Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, how they discuss uh, COVID and the situation and how this may also help to buffer anxiety amongst them. So in this way, yeah, being connecting, connected, although it's only online, can, can help people deal with uh, the situation. And then the third uh, aspect is really related to media entertainment during lockdown. Um, and here you can see indeed that apart from uh, news, um, yeah, indeed, people also, uh, yeah, look at entertainment contents or, um, and that this can also be beneficial. Uh, for instance, here you can see in this uh, study that entertainment media could be used to indeed fill time, uh, but also to reduce stress. And actually, we were mostly interested in uh, the role of media entertainment. So apart from news, how can media entertainment help people in some way uh, cope with uh, the situation? And this is just... Um, a slide um, showing actually the uh, ratings, the television ratings in Flanders. And this is for the first week of the lockdown. And in, right to you, in the red boxes, you can see uh, the news programs. So you can really see indeed that they scored well. Uh, people were at that moment really into the news and really wanted to be um, informed about the situation and all the uh, measures that were being taken by the government. So yeah, news was really high in ratings, but on the other hand, you also saw that, um, yeah, the traditional entertainment programs really scored high. So people didn't just watch the news, they also continued or even, uh, yeah, intensified their use of entertainment media. So you can see that some of the soaps uh, have really high ratings, like also in normal weeks, let's say, but also all other types of entertainment programs. So that's why we thought, okay, perhaps it's good to have a look at 
entertainment programs on television and how they can support us. And here, um, it is important to actually look at two types of entertainment experiences, because if you think about entertainment, I think perhaps most people think about indeed uh, programs that really, um, uh, yeah, make us enjoy the program that, that create fun, pleasure, arousal. But the literature on uh, media experiences, entertainment experiences, also shows that even these entertainment programs can create other types of gratifications. They can also be more meaningful. They can be very uh, moving. They, they can make us reflect about life. And that's why it's called, on the one hand, hedonic experiences versus more eudaimonic experiences. Um, just to give you an example, um, this is a scale that was developed by Oliver and Rainey, and they tried to uh, indeed uh, look at people's motivations to uh, consume these types of uh, entertainment. And you can see indeed the eudaimonic motivations, um, people who like, for instance, movies because they challenge their way of viewing the world or seeing the world because these movies make them more reflective, etc. So you could, for instance, imagine a movie like Dead Poet Society, which is a already an old uh, American movie, but it's with Robin Williams. And you actually see that in this movie, he is a very inspirational uh, teacher. And you also see that it's a very nice movie, but it's also a very moving um, movie because one of the students, students actually commits uh, suicide. So it's not just fun and excitement, it's also a very uh, triggering, very moving um, movie. And on the other hand, indeed you have, for instance, programs like movies that are more considered to be hedonic uh, movies, um, um, for instance, comic movies, uh, and of course, uh, Robin Williams is also known for that. So um, this already indicates that um, having a preference for eudaimonic or more hedonic entertainment uh, yeah, can also be part of yeah, your, your background, can also be part of yeah, the normal situation. And then the question is also, um, if you have a tendency, for instance, to watch more eudaimonic programs, will this be continued, for instance, in a pandemic? Or does a pandemic actually create a, more and more, or a bigger need for hedonic programs? Um, so that's the distinction between hedonic and eudaimonic entertainment. And here it's important to mention already that these two types of entertainment have also been linked to um, coping and adaptation. There is a, a, a very recent uh, theory uh, that really looks at how these two types of entertainment can actually help people to deal with like daily stressors, help them cope in a very daily situation but how they can also contribute to resili resilience, creating resilience uh, in a long-term perspective. And this is the model that you can see here, um, which actually shows that indeed people have certain resources to deal with the daily hassles and stressors. And here you can also see that there are actually two ways um, to um, help them recover because yeah, dealing with these stressors is indeed also exhausting. And you can see here that hedonic entertainment experiences are, are deemed essential and necessary and good because if you really focus on hedonic contents, they can indeed help you to detach from the problem. You don't think about the problem anymore and you get relaxed. And that's of course an advantage. But on the other hand, also eudaimonic entertainment can help people because eudaimonic entertainment can not only help to restore uh, the resources that have become depleted throughout the day, for instance, but eudaimonic uh, contents are also believed to help you to um, 
actually get new resources, develop new resources, new strength to deal with uh, daily hassles or with uh, stressors. So this is just to indicate that both hedonic and both eudaimonic contents might actually help us cope with uh, stress and that uh, they can also support, um, yes, uh, yeah, creating resilience and, and in this way they can also help us deal with future events. Um, so these are the two perspectives. So on the one hand, coping and stress and media use. And on the one other hand, you had the literature on uh, eudaimonic and hedonic uh, entertainment. Now, if you try to connect these two, um, you see some parallels. So for instance, if you look at avoidance coping from the perspective of um, the coping literature, you see that it's often associated with indeed uh, consuming hedonic media content. So if you're feeling stressed and you don't want to be confronted with uh, the problem, you will go to, um, let's say, some escapist media use and you will, for instance, uh, look for entertaining, fun media contents. And what is also actually an, an assumption here is that you will look for contents that don't remind you of the current problem situation you're in. So here, uh, the assumption then is that, yeah, people who are, who are stressed and who would like to avoid the problem, they will not look for, let's say, the news because there they can hear a lot of negative things about Corona and the situation um, and they will, like, they will like to avoid that. And even entertainment, that reminds them of, of Corona is, is something they would like to avoid. And here you could also see that, um, yeah, avoidance coping can have positive uh, outcomes, but um, actually, if you tend to rely on this strategy, it's often more assumed to be a, a kind of negative or maladaptive strategy. So that's the first line. The second line is more like uh, approach coping. So actually looking for uh, strategies to deal with the problem. Um, yeah, just yeah, confronting yourself with the problem and looking for solutions. And here uh, there is an assumption that this is perhaps more related than to, to eudaimonic media contents uh, where problems are are actually shown and where they also show that people deal with problems. And of course, if it's about something that could be related to Corona, this could actually be more informative or could actually be better. So let's say um, a movie about a virus where you see people dealing with this um, could be more, uh, something these people are looking for. And in general, approach coping is also uh, seen as actually better in the long run than avoidance coping. So this is how it is often um, uh, presented, but actually you can see that uh, there is not such a, uh, a, yeah, a strict uh, distinction between these two uh, types of, of reasoning. Uh, for instance, uh, you will notice that people often just not choose one coping strategy, uh, avoidance or approach coping, they often combine two. Uh, moreover, there are also some types of uh, strategies that actually can be either avoidance co coping or approach coping, like humor coping and uh, religious coping are. And then the same is true for hedonic media contents and eudaimonic, eudaimonic media contents. Sometimes media contents actually provide both experiences. They provide and fun and they are at the same time moving. And then a third aspect is actually um, related to indeed, does it make people uh, think about their situation? So is it for instance, Corona related or not? Um, and also here you can see that um, even um, some of the contents that might seem like humoristic programs, hedonic uh, programs, 
uh, can perhaps make people think of the situation. Um, and at the same time, even a program that is about Corona doesn't have to be eudaimonic. It can also be fun. You also saw a lot of jokes, for instance, about, about Corona. There were also programs where people were actually very humorous about the Corona situation. That's actually also a way of dealing with it. And then the last part is uh, that oftentimes it's actually uh, so that um, uh, actually showing flexibility, being able to combine, combine different co um, uh, styles of coping is, is seen as most adaptive. adaptive. Okay, um, just a few uh, things to end this uh, part. Uh, here you can see uh, a previous study that also looked at um, eudaimonic and hedonic uh, contents. Here you can see uh, some messages that people actually uh, used on social, me uh, social media uh, sites and that were shared uh, a lot. So these are the typical funny messages, but you already see that it's a, a tool to, to cope with uh, this situation by by laughing it, at it, actually. Uh, so all kinds of jokes were being uh, shared in this uh, uh, study and also tested on um, what effect they had. These are other types of contents that are shared on or were shared on social media sites. And these are more like the moving uh, stories, the moving uh, narratives, uh, for instance, indeed, uh, children who went and played music uh, for their neighbors uh, or a teacher who came to teach um, at the door of a student or one of the uh, doctors, for instance, um, who really uh, yeah, put a picture on his clothing so that the patients actually could see who he was. So these are more like the moving uh, contents. And here you can actually see that um, there is a combination of funny and meaningful messages. So again, posts that at the same time make us laugh, but on the other side, they also make us yeah, feel yeah, deeply moved actually uh, by, this, uh, by these posts. Um, and in this study, actually the combined uh, posts had the most uh, or the best outcomes. So they were best able to uh, create uh, positive feelings amongst uh, the persons and to also avoid negative feelings. So actually, this study suggested that a combination is actually most powerful. And this is also then a, a, a study amongst uh, a psychotherapists, which actually suggests the same, that we need some hedonic experiences. Also in a pandemic, we need to have fun. Sometimes we need to be distracted, uh, but we have to combine it, this with other types of coping. And we also need to be moved or we also need to be informed. And that brings me to our study. So we uh, actually looked at people's uh, pre-existing um, yeah, preferences for hedonic and eudaimonic contents. Uh, and we also looked at their coping styles and specifically if they use humor or religious coping styles. And we then tried to see how these factors actually um, uh, predicted their media use. So I will now uh, give the floor to Anouk and she will take us um, uh, to uh, the study and uh, present that study. Hey, thank you, Heidi. Um, I will now take over to share my screen and um, we will uh, pick right back up where we left off. Um, give a sign in the chat if something is not working. I, I think it, it should be working now. Um, so um, I would like to begin the part about our study, our research, a little bit by explaining the context within which we conducted our study. Because as you can see, our data collection took place um, 
in May of 2020. And for Belgium, it was a case that um, we were nearing the end of the first wave of COVID-19. Um, so some measures were still in place, you know, like to, to limit social, uh, so to maximize social distancing and to minimum, minimize contact uh, between us. But on the other hand, we were we're also going through a, a first exit strategy, like some first phases, which means that, um, for example, where work from home was, um, was mandatory before, now some people were allowed to return to the office maybe once or twice a week, definitely distancing, definitely using like ventilation systems and stuff. Uh, sports were very carefully beginning again, all outdoors, like, you know, that type of stuff. But on the other hand, public entertainment spaces were still closed. So no bars, no restaurants, no movie theaters. So when it came to that type of entertainment, people were still relying on what they had access to in their own homes. So that was something that, that we found interesting um, to think about as well. Um, what we did was conduct an online survey. Um, we had 336 participants after data cleaning. They were mostly female, 37 years old on average, pretty highly educated. Um, and also something to think about is that we limited uh, our participants after data cleaning to uh, people who live in Belgium and speak Dutch. Speaking Dutch was kind of self-selected because the survey was in Dutch. But then afterwards, we noticed that we did have some participants who were from the Netherlands, of course, also Dutch speaking people. But because they were going to different exit strategies, had different measurements in place. So we, we didn't really know how that cultural situation might come into place regarding the, the selections that they made. Or um, there's also, of course, a cultural difference when it comes to selecting entertainment. So we opted to really limit our participants to Dutch speaking Flemish people. So that is something to keep in mind. Um, Hedy already went through this a little bit, um, talking about uh, the, the television programs that people were looking at at the time. She discussed the television ratings. And before we actually started our, our study, like uh, with the vignettes, which, I'll, which I will explain later, um, we asked them, what have you been watching? So in the past week, um, before you're filling out the survey, what are the television programs that you watched or would have liked to watch if you maybe didn't have the time and imagine that you did have the time, what program would you be watching? And here um, we see that, you know, in the second place uh, compared to like the ratings, news uh, and information programming was definitely popular. But in the first place, we still see one of the most, um, most popular entertaining formats of the past years in Flanders. It's called The Mall. It's a game show where no celebrities, just regular people, nonfiction. And the success remained. Didn't matter whether there was COVID-19 or not. That was definitely still the most popular program also for our participants. Um, one that I would like to point out in the fourth place, uh, so the fourth most mentioned program uh, for our participants was something called Container Cup. And this is actually a new format that was invented specifically during COVID-19 because there was no more live sports to be broadcast. So sports um, program makers had no content to work with. So what they decided to do was, well, we'll make our own sports programming. They had a shipping container, uh, and therein, uh, people, both celebrities and celebrities and athletes, would perform like a, a small competition against each other. There was a leaderboard. There were commentators who gave funny remarks about the content, and the program became really popular. Uh, it appealed to both uh, sports fans and just regular fans because apparently, I didn't personally watch it, but I heard many good things about it. That it was funny. That it was entertaining. Um, so yeah, they, they kind of filled a hole there in, 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 uh, in the TV offering at the time. And uh, apparently it really worked. So that is something fun to mention, I think. But now on to our study, of course, also fun to mention. Um, we exposed our participants to four vignettes. It was a within design. So that means that each participant did actually get to see all four of these. And then afterwards, we asked them for each one, what are you expecting to get? Out of, this, uh, out of this television program, if you were to watch this, what do you think you will experience so that we know how they thought of the content that we were giving to them. But we also then asked them, so, and how willing are you? How, how likely is it that you would actually watch this television program so that we can see their viewing intentions? We manipulated these four vignettes to 
either be about COVID-19 or not, and to either stimulate this eudaimonic moving experience or not. Um, if you, just a, a quick refresher, what would that look like? Well, in the COVID-19 conditions, we attempted to um, put in elements that would show them how they could deal with the COVID-19 situation, how others were doing it, um, how we could help them put it into perspective, think more positive about it. So really going for like that approach type use. Uh, so being about COVID-19 and then being to help them use it as more like an approach coping tool. Um, on the other hand, for eudaimonic stimulation, we included elements uh, that could be considered moving, meaningful, thought-provoking, maybe like fascinating, inspirational content. And actually, I included two examples of what that would, would have looked like. Um, so these are the two vignettes that we actually used in our study. Um, I'll maybe give you a minute to read them. So, but they're both eudaimonic. One is not about COVID-19 and the other one was meant to actually be about COVID-19. So here, let me see whether I can, oh, no. I, if you can see the, the global health crisis that is literally mentioned in, in the COVID-19 um, vignette was really meant to like stimulate them to see like, okay, this is the type of content it's gonna be about the situation that I am currently in and it's gonna be very moving and meaningful and I'm gonna think about it. Um, if you want to see the other vignettes, they are included in our open science framework that you can find in the paper uh, relating to this uh, study as well. Um, but they're, they're quite similar, but then not meant to entice that eudaimonic experience. But let's move on to some of our first results. Um, so overall, we did find a main effect of our independent variables on the viewing intentions. And we saw that overall throughout our entire sample, people's, uh, people's intentions to watch content about COVID-19 were overall higher than to watch uh, content not about COVID-19. But it is important to say that we did find an interaction effect. So um, we saw that as long as, uh, so maybe important to mention when I'm going through this, uh, low approach means not COVID-19 related and high approach means it is related to COVID-19. Oh, that was not the intention. Okay, so what we see here is that when content is about COVID-19, people, prefer more um, not eudaimonic content. So this is important because we see here that when the content was not going to be about COVID-19, I said, okay, give me that meaningful, that, stim that, that, that moving thing that was their intentions to watch that was higher. But as soon as we introduced the topic of COVID-19, actually uh, it changed. Then people would prefer um, uh, content that was not meant to stimulate that eudaimonic experience. Um, but as we all know, there's much more going on than simply being the contents. As, as Hedy really clearly explained, there, there's uh, preferences, there's the way we cope with things, there's how we're feeling at the moment. So let's take a closer look at how those preferences and the coping strategies that we use might actually have influenced their viewing intentions here. So to do that, I, I like to use like four uh, participants. Uh, you can imagine that these people are all just the same person. They're all 37 years old. Uh, they, come, they all come from Flanders. So there's just the same, but they have one thing that uh, separates them from everyone else. For example, a preference for either a hedonic experience or a eudaimonic experience, or the use of humor as a coping mechanism or religion as a coping mechanism. And that will help us to think about, you know, how, how are these people actually selecting their entertainment during these moments. For people with a hedonic preference, we hypothesized that they would, compare to those without hedonic preferences, that they would have higher intentions, so they would be more willing to watch content that is low on approach, so not about COVID-19, and low on eudaimonic stimulation. And so not that meaningful, not that thought provoking, just not taking that, that into consideration. And our results showed exactly that. Um, the most, the easiest way to understand these slides is actually by looking at the green lines and then comparing them here. So here we clearly see that those who have high hedonic preferences, uh, their intentions to watch 
that low approach content are higher than those who have low hedonic preferences. Again, for low eudaimonic, so not meant to stimulate that eudaimonic experience, people with high hedonic preferences, their intentions to watch um, low eudaimonic content are higher than for those with low hedonic uh, preferences. Um, so here our hypotheses were confirmed and this is in line because based on previous research it would make sense that people who enjoy hedonic experiences would be less open to those more complex emotional experiences that is just not what they're looking for in selecting their entertainment um, and also as Harry already mentioned that semantic affinity um, we, we expected that they would not be going for content related to COVID-19 as well. And that was confirmed uh, here. Then there are people who have eudaimonic preferences, who go looking for that meaningful, that thought-provoking content. And here we expected that these people would go for content about COVID-19, so what we call high approach content and high eudaimonic content, you know, keeping in line, following their preferences throughout. We, we hypothesized that that would not change uh, during a difficult situation, such as um, being in a lockdown or, or social distancing, uh, especially when compared to people with low eudaimonic preferences. And here, interestingly enough, we actually, we, we found that those eudaimonic preferences that, that definitely keeps in line being uh, Preferring eudaimonic content is definitely still something that, that makes people go for that eudaimonic content. You can see the difference between people with low eudaimonic preferences. What I really like is that they actually, they, they like low eudaimonic stimuli just as much, while people with low eudaimonic preference, that we do see a gap there between their, uh, between their viewing intentions, while people with high eudaimonic preferences, their viewing intentions are um, about the same. Um, but we didn't find any significant results regarding their approach preferences. So uh, those differences were not significant between the people with high eudaimonic preferences or low eudaimonic preferences. That, that was not uh, something that predicted their selection of COVID-19 related content or not. So this is, uh, these were the results regarding um, the entertainment preferences that you have and how they may predict what content you will select. And now we'll be moving on to our results regarding what coping strategies people use and how they may be used as an instrument in selecting uh, entertainment. The first one that uh, we looked at was the use of humor as a coping strategy. And actually for the coping strategies, rather than making hypotheses, we also included a research question. The first one, the hypotheses were, well, if you use humor as a coping strategy, you'll probably have higher intentions to watch low eudaimonic uh, content. Um, but as, as we already mentioned, um, humor can be used as both an avoidant and an approach coping strategy. So here we didn't really have a direction we wanted to look at. So we rather went with um, a, a research question rather than hypothesizing. Um, and here, um, when we are looking at the differences between those who use humor as a coping strategy and those who did not, we found a three-way interaction between uh, the condition of COVID-19, eudaimonic content, and the use of humor as a coping strategy. Let's zoom in a little bit because those three-way interactions can be a bit tricky. Um, so here, Imagine that each of these lines is one of our four vignettes. And you see that three of these seem to follow the same trend. Overall, people who use humor as a coping mechanism, their viewing intentions for all of our programs were lower than for people who do not use humor as a coping mechanism. But for one of those, the slope is different. And that one was the, pro the television program that was about COVID-19, but was not going to give them that eudaimonic experience. In that case, their intentions went higher. Now, this is something that is not included in our presentation, but that we did discuss in our paper. And this vignette was actually quite literally comedy about COVID-19. So people did really go for that. And you can see that they, they use humor as a coping mechanism. And when a, a television program gives exactly that, that is gonna be their preference. So they did really select in function of that. Um, this is also, it's not that they, had to choose between four television programs 
acceptance and then shows this. These are really their viewing intentions for each one of them separately and it is way higher. Um, you can also see that that was also the most popular program, let's say for people who don't use humor as a coping mechanism, but it is still significantly higher for those who do use humor as a coping mechanism. So that was really a, an interesting thing to see here. And then finally, we also looked at the use of religion as a coping strategy. Here again, we uh, predicted that people with, uh, who use religion as a coping strategy would go for high eudaimonic content when we compare it to people who don't use religion. Um, and then again, we didn't know, uh, is it gonna be an avoidant or an approach uh, coping strategy? Let's look into that a little bit. Um, and we found, um, we, we could confirm our hypotheses. Yes, people who use religion as a coping strategy um, show higher intentions to watch um, eudaimonic content, high eudaimonic content when compared to people who don't use religion as a coping strategy. But again, and this is interesting because it's similar to people with those eudaimonic preferences, no results were found regarding whether the content should be about COVID-19 or not. So that really didn't have an influence. And we really, uh, would encourage future studies to look into that connection. Um, we know that some work has been done already about this uh, regarding eudaimonia and those feelings of self-transcendence, spirituality, and, and what that entails, and the fact that we see similar results for people who use religious coping, um, that might be interesting uh, to look at. And we would also encourage pe um, studies to look at the way that, you know, what is it that determines whether religion is used as an approach or an avoidant coping strategy? Um, so what individual traits may play a role there, um, especially when it comes to entertainment, for example, and how that could all be related. I think that could be really interesting. So that was it regarding our results for today. But um, before I end our presentation, I would want to address some key takeaways from our research. Um, what I like to do to, to, to better my understanding of our study is think of our entertainment preferences as a map. Like you have this map where, and you can go everywhere and each house, each building is an entertainment offering, a television program that you can watch. And the way that people move through that map is by using, what, among many things, their coping strategy. So that is their guide for finding their way on that map. As we saw, you know, people who use humor as a coping mechanism end up with a humorous uh, television program about COVID-19. So how you make your way through that is, um, is actually following a certain guide that you have. But entertainment preferences, they persist. That's why I call them the map. Even in difficult times such as COVID-19, the map stays the same. It's the way you find your way through that that may be influenced by it. And we saw in our study that entertainment is selected in this instrumental way, alerting us that we should not consider entertainment simply as a standalone coping behavior, as it sometimes is approached that way, but rather as a tool to, to engage in our coping behaviors. Um, so we really use it as, as an instrument there. And then finally, of course, these results are not limited to the field of media or entertainment, but, but definitely the field of media psychology and stress and well-being as well. Um, and that was it for us for today. But if you have any questions, I, of course, welcome them now, or you can always send us an email or reach out to us via any form of social media. But most of all, thank you for being here today and for having us. I have a particular question to you uh, because, um, the, as you know, probably the strategy of some uh, of some big uh, video aggregators and uh, big uh, online entertaining platforms was to, uh, let's say, to to broadcast and to commercialize some particular series or movies about pandemic. So movies about fantastic pandemic or about a particular situation with a, a sanitary crisis or something like that. And especially I'm thinking, for example, about the uh, Russian series with the extraordinary success on Netflix, which, uh, which is called To the Lake. Uh, so, uh, and uh, as, we, as we can see, uh, it can be considered uh, from this perspective uh, as a dual result, yeah, because from one hand, it's a purely 
let's say it's the purely entertaining it's the purely uh how, how how to say detaching from reality yeah but from another hand it's about pandemic it's about particular virus etc and from this point of view it uh, encouraged people to think about the viruses about uh pandemic etc can you uh, how can you uh uh, how can you interpret such kind of series and, and their success uh, through your theory here, through this uh, approach? Thanks. Mm -hmm. well, I think that uh, people indeed can even learn from fiction. Um, I know that there are other, other studies that had, that had, for instance, looked at people who had been victimized, uh, so have, had become the victim of uh, violence. And then they looked at their preferences, pre preferences and actually some of them preferred to watch crime series, something that could re remind them of their uh, own situation. But then actually the message of these uh, programs was actually very reassuring. Like, okay, you can be the victim of something really bad like violence, but in the end, the perpetrator will get his punishment, everything becomes good. So even if something reminds you, and although it's fiction, it can still help you. But I do think that this would be more common than for people who really have uh, that style of approach coping. So yeah, being willing to, to get confronted with the situation, but at the same time, also perhaps be informed about how you could deal with this situation yourself and also being reassured that in the end, everything turns out well. So I guess that that might be a similar reasoning for people in a pandemic. You see, although it's fiction, a kind of similar situation. So there is that semantic uh, affinity and there is that relevance. And as it's often in these types of movies or, or series, actually, and in the end, everything is 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 coming yeah to a good ending uh, let's say and i i also thought of, of when we think about it this everything comes to a, like the ending will be all right maybe people were looking to like fast forward a little bit you know we did not know how long this was going to take and then you kind of get to go through it and you know that there's an end point because the season will end the series will end the movie will end and then you see, okay, that, that has an ending. We will have an ending as well throughout this. So maybe mm -hmm. that could play a role. I also thought of a classic social down, downward social comparison. Like at least it's not as bad as look at that movie, look at that disaster. At least I'm still healthy in my house. That could also have been maybe mm -hmm. something uh, at play there. Uh, I'm thinking about your comparison with the prison in the beginning of the uh, of the of your presentation because uh, yes the idea that uh, we can be compared with the prisoners yeah so as mm -hmm. a people uh, separated from the from the reality not able to 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 go um, uh, to go uh, on the streets etc uh, etc et uh, but from another hand of course there is a huge difference. This difference, this is a social media. Yeah? So people uh, yeah. during this coronavirus and uh, the pandemic or infodemic has been confronted with, uh, with, let's say, combining the traditional media consumption, the consumption of entertaining TV and video, etc., mm -hmm. with, a, let's say, the consumption of social media. And social media, this is a social interaction. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So it's not a classic entertainment, it's social interaction. You are interacting mm -hmm. with someone, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about, uh, about uh, the uh, social media, how they are affecting such kind of entertaining uh, television uh, uh, practice? Hmm. Well, I think, of course, social media are very good uh, for providing social support. So that's a coping strategy that they are really good at uh, in supporting, I think. And the social support can be um, emotional support, being able to share your feelings and getting feedback on that. 
but it can also be more like informational uh, support, uh, like getting real advice from people, uh, real instructions about what to do or not to cope with a certain problem that is linked to the situation. Um, I'm, I'm not really sure how it is related to media entertainment. Um, I, I think that, um, yeah, I think that we saw a rise for both types of communication. So on the one hand, indeed, people were really looking or watching a lot of television. We really saw that uh, the, yeah, the, the viewing figures were, were higher and that people were spending more time also because they were at home, uh, of course. But also that social media were consulted a lot uh, and that, for instance, those memes or those comic memes were being spread, etc. So, yeah, I think they support similar kinds of strategies, but of course, the social media are more uh, in line with really providing social support, uh, which is, of course, Perhaps, perhaps a little bit less uh, present in entertainment television, although some of the programs that we sketched in our vignettes also really uh, yeah, uh, talked about yeah, showing people, helping each other, people actually in the same situation as yourself. So yeah, there are some similarities and some differences, I think. I, I, I would also like to add that regarding the, the social function of social media and entertainment there is the the, the notion of co-viewing through social media as well in second screening and then mm -hmm. if we think of twitter as like the virtual water cooler then of course if there's no longer a water cooler because you're not going to the office then then turning to to this is something that also happens outside of uh, of being locked inside during a pandemic of course but people do turn to twitter to see what other people are sharing about it or, or now I say Twitter but but there's research that also shows that people do it just via messenger on WhatsApp on other social media they make groups with friends that they know or we're all watching the same television program let's talk about it a little bit here so that way they do use co-viewing that entertainment to look for that social connection maybe at a time when there was a bit less you know like natural circumstances to look for it. So that may have been something uh, that was happening, but I don't think I've seen any research specifically during uh, the pandemic now about that. Uh, yes, thank you. Yes, I think that uh, it can be interesting to, 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 to speak about uh, in, a, in, the, in the future to make a kind of, uh, uh, of research uh, about the second screen practice, about how people are discussing during the quarantine, during the, the mm -hmm. self-isolation, how they're discussing their television and entertaining mm -hmm. kind of content, how, uh, how they are building communities around such kind of content, and especially how they are building communities around coronavirus, uh, let's say coronavirus news, because uh, uh, it's very topical, and uh, uh, as, mm -hmm. as we may see, uh, there are a lot of, uh, let's say, impact in social media on the reality of coronavirus. And there are some people discussing uses, etc. And we can see uh, some polarization, for example, in the United States. Uh, I, I was told recently by my colleague uh, who is living in the United States during a long time, but uh, who is very involved in let's say, Russian-speaking community. Mm -hmm. And he said to me that this Russian-speaking community of people in social media has been truly divided on two camps. One camp is, a, let's, say, let's say, coronavirus pessimists. Hmm. And, and such people are very, very attentive. They are looking for any kind of news, etc. They are very criticizing Trump uh, coronavirus measures etc 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 from another end the covid dissidents who are basically supporting let's say populist discourse that this is just a flu so they, this is just a common flu uh, mm -hmm. and uh, that's why let, let, let's reopen everything etc uh, etc et it's just a common flu and uh, i think that such kind of polarization around uh, around around news about coronavirus also can mm -hmm. be very interesting thing to, to, to discuss.